Welcome back. In this middle lesson we are going to investigate another sampling procedure which is called the acceptance rejection method. In the previous middle lesson we investigated the inverse transform method that we used to transform the random numbers from random number generator into random numbers that uh, will have a specific probability density function. Now you may remember that the inverse transform method was applicable to those random variables which had the cumulative distribution function that could be inversed. And uh, not every random variable has a cumulative distribution function that can be inversed. So in that case we can use the acceptance rejection method that does not have this requirement. The idea of the acceptance rejection method is very simple. Let me demonstrate it on a, an example. Let's take uh, the example of the energy of fission neutrons. Uh, so the energy of fission neutrons is uh, described by a probability density function that has approximately this form. It's the so-called Watt spectrum. So we have the energy and this is the probability function, probability density function for the energy of fission neutrons. Let me put some values on it. Now the energy spectrum of fission neutrons is uh, possible to approximate by an analytic fu function but that is pretty difficult to invert. So therefore we cannot uh, easily use the inverse transform method for this random variable. I'm going to explain the basic idea of the acceptance rejection method on a simplified concept. I'm going to close the probability density function into a box. Just like this. So let's just assume that there is 10 MeV at this point. So, so we want to sample the energy of fission neutrons from 0 to 10 MeV. So, the basic idea of the acceptance rejection method is to sample randomly points uniformly within this box. So let's say that I choose randomly point here, 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 here. Randomly I will cover the whole area in the box. Now in order to select a single point we need two random numbers, right? One random numbers. So let's take the example of, of, of this point here. So one random number needs to select the energy and the other one needs to select the number from 0 to, in, to 1 in this case. So the energy here it could be something like uh, 4 MeV. So the idea is if the point that you randomly select within the area falls below the curve given by the probability density function, then we accept the energy, right? In this case energy. If it falls above the curve, like this point, this, this, all this here, then we reject the energies that we sampled. 
So this energy we reject, this one we reject. All these will be rejected. So these points will be accepted. So that means that we accept the energy here. So that was about half MeV. This one energy is accepted. This one is accepted. This and this. So I think it's very clear from this example that many more samples will be accepted in this area where the probability density function has a largest value. Here, where the probability density function is small, most of these samples, or actually all of them in our case, were rejected. They fell above the curve. So it's very easy to see that if you sample many more points, millions or billions, then the probability density function of the energies that we select with our method will fit exactly to the probability density function of fission neutrons. So the idea of the acceptance rejection method is simple and uh, the advantage is that you don't need the inversion of the cumulative distribution function, you only need to know the probability density function and that's all. Uh, however, there is a, a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that you need to generate two random numbers in order to sample a point within the area. That is one disadvantage because only one of them will be used as a for our purpose for, for sampling the energy. The other one is only to decide whether the energy is accepted or rejected, right? So the height decides whether it falls below or above the curve given by the probability density function and this fact decides whether we accept the energy or not. So, so you need two random numbers. Uh, so you may lose some computing efficiency because of this and you may lose more computing efficiency because you are rejecting some points. So we are generating random numbers uh, but then you are rejecting them. Now you can see that uh, the bigger is the area above this curve, above the probability density function, the bigger is this area as compared to the area below the curve, the worse efficiency you will achieve for uh, generating the random numbers for your random variable. So actually there is a way to improve the efficiency of generating your random numbers by choosing uh, another shape of this area. So uh, we started with the box. We had a box because that is very simple for us to choose randomly points within the box. You simply generate random number from 0 to 1 and then you scale the number to your required interval. So uh, in, in, in case of our uh, horizontal axis we needed to sample randomly energy from 0 to 10 MeV. So we just multiply the random number that we get from the random generator by number 10 and we can use it directly. As for the vertical axis, I picked number 1 here, but there could be any number. I remember the maximum of the probability density function doesn't need to be 1. We, we know that the area below the curve equals 1, but the maximum could be any number below 1. It could be 0 0.1 or 0 0.5. So, so it doesn't need to be 1. But it doesn't matter, we simply multiply the 
the random number that we get from the random number generator by the maximum uh, number. So closing the probability density function in a box area is very convenient, um, but it's not the most efficient way, depending on how large area remains above the probability density function within the box. So the method could become much more efficient if we actually could close the probability density function uh, in another box, not the rectangular box, but another one, for instance, a tri triangular one like this. So now if I sampled randomly points within the triangle, I would basically be more successful. I would be rejecting fewer points that I generate because I would simply avoid this big area altogether. I would be just rejecting those samples that would fall accidentally here. So that's fine. Uh, however, it's more problematic to sample the points within the triangle unless I can use the inverse transform method to sample the energies uh, from a probability density function that would have such a triangular shape. Now you need to understand that this triangular function cannot be a probability density function because if you integrate the area below this triangle you would surely get a bigger number than one. How do I know it? Well I know it because I know that this is our probability density function for the energy spectrum of fission neutrons. I define it as, as a probability density function so therefore the integral of this function is exactly 1. The area below this curve, the black one, is 1. However, the area of the triangle is bigger. So the function that describes this triangle here, yeah, it cannot be probability density function because I know that when I integrate the probability density function I must get one exactly, but in this case I would get a number which is bigger than one. However, it's very simple to find out the probability density function that would give us the random numbers with the triangular probability distribution. I can simply scale down this triangular function so that its integral is one, right? So I can calculate the area below this triangle. So let's say that the area would be C. And then I divide the values by C. So I will get a new function that would look uh, something like <coughs> this. A new triangle which would have area equal to 1 exactly. So in this case I could say that this blue triangle could be used as a probability density function for a new random variable. Now before we proceed let me just mark all these functions by their names. So the black one, the original probability density function, let's mark it by F. The red triangle or let's, let's mark the blue triangle now. It's, it's a probability density function that I will call H. And the red one is a, a function that we can describe as H multiplied by C, by the C factor. Now at this point I can uh, employ the inverse transform method with the h 
function, the H uh, probability density function, in order to sample the energies. So I'm going to sample randomly energies from 0 to n MeV using the inverse transform method. So, uh, so I need to calculate the cumulative distribution function. So I need to integrate this H probability density function to get the cumulative distribution function. And that way I can start generating the points within the triangle. I still need uh, the second random number uh, that samples the distance in the uh, vertical direction. However, those random numbers I need to scale in such a way that they will fall within the red triangle, not the blue triangle. I want to cover the area of the red triangle. So uh, <clears throat> the idea is simple. I'm using the probability density function given by this H function to generate in our case energies that would have uh, this triangular spectrum, energy spectrum. So for instance I select 5 MeV here. So that is one random number and then I need another random number in order to position the point within the triangle. So I need to position the point somewhere along this line. And I know that the maximum number here is HC. So H is the probability density function. So I evaluate it at 5 MeV. And I multiply it by the C vector. So uh, that is the maximum value. So I simply can choose randomly a number from 0 to 1 and multiply it by HC, which will scale it within the interval 0 up to HC. So this way I can sample randomly the points within the red triangle. And again, those which will fall above the original probability density function F will be rejected. Those which will fall below it, I will accept and I will record the energy that corresponds to those points falling below the curve. So that is the whole idea. So let me now just summarize the acceptance rejection method here. Our objective is to generate random numbers for a random variable that is described by the probability density function f. Now if we could invert its corresponding cumulative distribution function we could possibly use the inverse transform method. But uh, that is not always possible to do. So in that case we use the acceptance rejection method. So in the acceptance rejection method we generate random numbers using another probability density function H for which we can easily invert its corresponding cumulative distribution function. Then we are using the C parameter that scales the H probability density function in such a way that it completely encloses the original F probability density function. So for all possible x values the original probability density function is smaller or equal to the product of the h, the new probability density function and the c factor. In order to generate a random number by the acceptance rejection method we need to generate two random numbers by uh, random number generators. One is generated from the uh, H probability density function by the inverse transform method and the other one is, is taken directly from the random number generator without any transformation. 
So we have two random numbers, x and u. Now we accept the x number if this condition is satisfied, if the product of the random number u scaled by the ch factor falls below the value of the original probability density function evaluated at the x random number. If this condition is satisfied, we accept the x random number and when the condition is not satisfied then we have to reject the x random number and we have to repeat the process until the condition is satisfied. So we need to generate a new random number x, we need to generate a new random number u and we need to evaluate this condition again. So every time a random number is needed this pro procedure needs to be followed. And the efficiency of the acceptance rejection method can be easily evaluated. We know that the proportion of the samples that are accepted is equal to the ratio of the area below the original probability density function f and the ch function that encloses completely the original probability density function. We know that when you integrate the probability density function of any random variable we need to get one exactly, so that's here. When we look at the other integral, uh, we can see that dc is a constant. We can take it out from the integral. And what's left is the integral of the probability density function h, which by definition is 1 as well. Therefore, this ratio of two integrals must be equal to 1 over c. So when c is a large number, then the ratio of those samples which are accepted is very small as compared to those samples which are rejected. So the efficiency is bad. So in order to improve the efficiency, the c constant needs to be as close to 1 as possible. And that is possible only when the h probability density function is very close to the original probability density function f. Now it may be of course very difficult to find such a function, h function that will uh, resemble the original probability density function closely and yet uh, function for which we can find uh, the inverse cumulative distribution function. And that's all for now and I will see you in the next mini lesson.